What is it that makes America great? What's the secret of success? I'm Pinchas Taylor, and this is Taylor Talks. So welcome, everybody. We're here with Mr. Bernie Marcus, one of the co-founders of Home Depot, among many, many other uh, virtues and wonderful things that he's accomplished in his life. And we're here to talk about the greatness of America. First of all, thank you very much for having us in your home. And uh, one, of, one of the things that, that touched me when we had met each other a few weeks ago was you were talking very passionately. You could see on your face the love of America that, that you have. And I was wondering, um, you said you even cried during the national anthem, which, I, which, is, which is beautiful. I love it. Where does this love of America for you come from? Well, you know, everything starts somewhere. And frankly, mine started with my parents. My parents were Russian immigrants. Uh, my father came from the Ukraine. My mother came from Russia. They came at a very early age. They ran away from pogroms, which is a pretty horrible experience for Jews in Europe. And uh, they moved to America. We lived when I was born. Uh, we were living in a tenement, a fourth floor walk-up tenement, no heat, no air conditioning. Uh, can you imagine that today, uh, living <laughs> in those kind of things? That's 90 years ago we're talking about. Uh, but they were hardworking. My father was a carpenter and made very little money. He was a successful businessman, a great craftsman in his own right, but he couldn't make money. I just didn't know how to make money. And uh, my mother was a, uh, a housewife with osteoarthritis. She, her hands were crippled up and her legs were crippled up her feet, uh, but she was in pain constantly, 24 hours a day. And with all of that, they talked about this is the golden land. And a golden land, imagine that, living in a tenement, uh, the way we did, uh, as poor as can be, uh, food was a, a problem. There were no food stamps in those days. If you didn't make it, if you didn't earn money, you were dead in the water. And uh, they, they, they struggled. But it was always this golden land, this great land of ours. And I got it from them. The, the, the best day of my mother's life was the day... She and my father became citizens of the United States. She cried like a baby. Uh, this is something she had lived for. This she had reached the pinnacle of being a citizen of this great country. And she constantly said to me, uh, Bernala, you can be whatever you want to be. If you want to be president of the United States, you could do it here. And she spoke Yiddish to me because we spoke Yiddish in the house. And she said, there's nothing to stop you except you. You'll, you'll be the one to stop yourself. If you work hard, if you're diligent, if you're better than other people, uh, if you use your head, and she said, sechel, if you use a sechel, which is common sense, you can beat anybody at anything. And so uh, I listened to her very carefully, and she was obviously right. Uh, but think about it. Think about where I am today, the fact that I'm very wealthy, I've accomplished everything I want to accomplish, had a successful business career, uh, and it happened in this country. And this country allowed me to grow as good as I could be and to reach the pinnacle of where my success would lead me. Uh, it was a challenge all along the way. We had a lot of disappointments. We had things that worked against us. But truthfully, when you sum it up, at the end of the day, uh, here I am, uh, being able to do the things that my mother talked about, tzedakah, uh, giving back to the community, doing good for others, and not being selfish about my life. And so, yeah, when I, when I, when I see the American flag and people sing, God bless America, 
it affects me uh, intrinsically. It, it hits it hits my my innards, and um, I just I, I I worry about children today uh, that they don't really understand how good things are for them. Even the poorest per person, they are so far ahead of where I was. Uh, that it's it's incomparable. It's incomparable. I mean, it, you don't go. First of all, you don't uh, go hungry because there's always some place that to, have, to get food. Medicals uh, is there for you, no matter how poor you are. You can have medical. Good, and 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 truthfully, what what is the boundary for people today? The only boundary is their minds. Is their minds and. A lot of people think that they're they're victims of of what they have. Even even the kids that have plenty think they're victims. Right. And so I don't quite get it. I don't quite understand <laughs> it. But it's a new age. It's a new place, and um, we just have to be thankful that we're here, and that we have the benefits of this country. Well, would you say that the greatness of America has? decreased since, let's say, the 1950s or the 1970s? Is, is, uh, has its greatness decreased? Has, uh, I know certainly American pride ha is, is diminishing, unfortunately, amongst certain segments of our society. You, you, you said that uh, you know, people don't realize how good they actually have it. No, no, you, no I, don't think it's, I don't think it's decreased at all. And in fact, if anything, it's increased. The opportunities are out there. Uh, the minorities, listen, I wanted to be a doctor. I couldn't get into, into medical school because I was Jewish. They had a quota on how many Jewish students. What, there's no problem today if you're black or, or, or yellow or what. You can get into any university today if you have the brains. If you have the brains and you have the... Uh, but, but, but most people carry themselves as victims today. I was right, all, right. and plus the fact, I, I don't really believe what I what I read, uh, that a a uh, a very high percentage of young people believe that socialism is better than capitalism. Well, my God, how stupid do you have <laughs> to be? Just go to Cuba, go to Venezuela. Go to any of these countries that had it. Why do you think all these people are trying to get across the border to get the hell away from socialism? They don't want socialism. And the young people in America, spoiled brats as far as I'm concerned, are supporting socialism. And if they get it, they'll pay the penalty along with their children and their children's children. I, I do everything in my power to fight it because I, rec I recognize how innocent, naive, and basically dumb they are. Uh, they run to these candidates who free this, free that, free college, free medical, free that. Nothing is free in this world. You pay for it, and what you're gonna pay for it in is freedom. You're gonna give up your freedom. And in socialism, you go to Cuba, you open your mouth, you're shot. You go to Venezuela, you open your mouth, you're shot. You go to Russia, you open your mouth, you're shot. In China, you're dead. And so all of you people that believe in that, <laughs> go there, get the hell out of my country <laughs> and leave us be. I hear. Well, what do you, so what do you think would, is, the, is the source of that victim mentality and that desiring everything from to be handed to you? Where do you think the source well, of that Well, people, be? people uh, uh, again, it goes back to being the victim. You're the victims. Uh, of everything. I don't know what the hell you're a victim of, but <laughs> if they go to university, they hear from university professors who are left-wing socialists themselves, and they inculcate this into their, the students, and the students begin and think, you know that on some universities you can't say the word American dream. Did you know that? No, I didn't. No, it's, it's forbidden. That's terrible. On, on several, <laughs> you can't say the American dream, which is what I lived. Yeah. Now, why couldn't you say that? Well, that's the beginning of the, the loss of freedom. Uh -huh. You can't say what you want. And these professors on these universities have, have turned out a generation of people that think they're victims, that think that everything is bad in this country, 
that this country is the problem because that's what they think. These are people that um, uh, constantly believe that our system is a bad system and doesn't work. And the truth is, the system does work. But, it, but if the, you know, we're in an election year and we may make a, a direction very shortly in November that there'll be no coming back from. This country will be finished. People like me will be done. The, the great stories in America will cease to be and will turn into Venezuelans. If that's the case. It, but, if. but I hope the American people are smarter than that. Remember, Venezuela was the richest country in the world. Think about this. Crazy. The richest country in the world. Today, there's no medicine. There's no food. They're eating dog in the street. Yeah. It's, they're, it's, they're, it's, they're, 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 they're leaving in droves. Do we want that? Well, <laughs> somebody has to get to the American people, the people that are supporting it. And there are millions of supporting it. Particularly the, the young, right? Uh, that, particularly the, the young. That's where the enthusiasm yep, towards yep, that. Yep, yep, yep. And it's naivete. Uh, and um, I, I just don't know where it comes from. I don't know how it starts. I don't know about their parents. Uh, these kids went to school. Most of them uh, come from families that are fairly well off. And their parents have done a very poor job in explaining how they how lucky they are in having what they have. Rather, they think in terms of, uh, I don't have what I really want. They want what I have without working for it. Right. Yeah. That, but I work for it. I worked 80 hour weeks. Are they willing to work 80 hour weeks? I worked many, many, many 80 hour weeks. I, I think when you, yeah, when you put the work in, it's sooner or later that the success is gonna happen. The, the, the victim mentality certainly leads to a lack of motivation. You know, when you, when you and Ken Langone and uh, Arthur, Arthur Blank yeah. were starting Home Depot, do, would you say that finding able-bodied, motivated people today is much more difficult than it was in, 19, in the late 1970s when you yeah. were starting? Yes, yes, yes. First of all, you don't have the drugs that you have now. Mm -hmm. So you look at a, a thousand people 250 people whoosh, are gone. They're marijuana, they're, 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 they're stoked out of their heads, uh, so they're not available. Uh, then you have this, this other mid group that really doesn't want to work hard. They want nine to five jobs and are very satisfied to talk about what everybody else has and why their failures can be blamed on other people. Um, but there is still that percentage of high energy, enthusiastic people that really want to make something and create something. And thank God we have them. Thank God. And, and they are um, uh, gems. And we still find them at Home Depot. We really have some people that we uh, are able to bring aboard that are just terrific. They're wonderful. They want to work hard, they want, but I would say they're not the minority. They are the minority and not the majority. It's shrinking. The, the, the it's shrinking. There's no question about it. In my day and age, if you think about where I came from, people worried about feeding themselves. They had a, uh, they had a, a desire to make something of themselves, to create something, uh, to be able to take care of themselves. They didn't want, they didn't want anybody to take care of them. They don't want people... To, to the government to, uh, to, to give them a, a, an unearned income. Uh, they wanted to make it on their own. And that group of people that was a plurality when I was a young kid have gone down to a small majority, minority now. That's sad. It's really sad for America. Uh, but, you know, you go to the Midwest, uh, you go out of the cities, you go out of the East Coast, you go out of the West Coast, and America, the people in the middle, they're, they're really still Americans. That's right. They still believe in a flag. They still believe in themselves. They believe in themselves, and they believe in freedom. They, they believe in the freedom to speak freely, act freely, have the religion that they want to have, right. and be able to uh, uh, be religious and not be ashamed of their religion. 
Uh, but in the West Coast and the East Coast, uh, New York, New Jersey, and California, you don't find that. Sorry to say. I have an aunt and a grandmother that lives in Atlanta. And every year when we go to visit them, we go to the aquarium. Oh, yeah. And so one of the things that uh, hit me and uh, that I really enjoyed hearing from you was when you founded and funded the aquarium, you didn't just write a check. You got to know the ins and outs of aquarium design. And you really, I mean, you really dedicated your focus in knowing the whole craft. You said that uh, when, you, when you got contractors that were telling you that uh, you can't build an aquarium that size, or you can't build a tank that size, and yeah. you said, okay, well, this is, this is what we're gonna do, and, and, and you ended up doing it. If you were going to dedicate, it, let's, say, let's say tomorrow, you were going to focus your attention on getting to know the inner craft of what our nation's challenges are, America's challenges, some of the ones that you mentioned, the victim mentality, the lack of motivation, depression, uh, teen alienation, uh, all, of the, all of the problems that we have. If you were going to identify the craft, the design of where the problem lies, where would you look and what would you do uh, what would you do about it? I think it starts at the education system. I think that we have, uh, for a country with the wealth that we have, the talent that we have, uh, we're somewhere around in the Western world, I think we're rated 34th in education. Uh, that's pathetic. It's pathetic. Yeah. Government-run school systems don't work. I'm a great supporter of charter schools, uh, religious schools, charter schools. Sure. Uh, because uh, there, uh, people are serious. There, the teachers are more concerned about teaching the children than they are about their salaries. Uh, there, uh, education has a chance to flourish. And our kids are getting dumb by the day. They're getting dumber. Uh, we, I call it the dumbing down of America. It is the dumbing down of America. And so if you have a school that's a failure, Rather than trying to make that school a better school, we try to make that the model of all schools so that we lower our standards right, yeah. to match them. <laughs> right, I mean, right, does, does that right. make sense that's to social, you? Well, that's like a socialism ideology in education. Yeah, rather Just than- lower it all for everybody. Rather than have, listen, when I went to school, I went to public schools. The teachers were great. They were phenomenal. My education, both in, in, in grammar school, high school, uh, all public schools, the teachers were phenomenal. They wanted to teach you. Uh, they were concerned about you. They were involved with you. Uh, I, I think that public schools today have lost it. In those days, if a teacher wasn't good, she was fired. Today, you want to fire a teacher? <laughs> Goodbye. <Right. laughs> Goodbye. They, they have a little place that they put them. Teachers who should be fired, they can't work anymore, uh -huh. and they keep getting salaries, and they go to some place right. that, uh, and every city has it, by the way. So we have incompetent teachers teaching students who become incompetent. They don't know math. Uh, they don't know English. Uh, they, uh, I, I, a, big, a big problem, uh, immigrants that come across the country that don't ever learn English. Uh, my and they and and they're talking now about one party. If they come across, let them vote. Why would I let somebody vote that doesn't speak the language? Uh, when my mother and father became uh, citizens of the United States, the criteria was they had to learn English first. Mm. So we spoke Yiddish in the house, and then my mother one day announced to my father, "From this day forward, we are speaking English. Mm. We are speaking English in the house." because I want to become a citizen. And my father said, nah, you know, in Yiddish, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and she said, you, Joe, you're speaking English from this day forward, otherwise nobody's answering you. And she told all the children, my, 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 my sister, my two brothers, don't, don't talk to your father unless he speaks English. And mm -hmm. we start speaking English. And that helped my father in his business, by the way, because now all of a sudden he could get some English out and began to learn how to read English, which was very important to him. Today, uh, that's not an issue. So you have public schools where you actually have 10 languages. 
taught in the class. Mm. Well, how do, how, do you, <laughs> how do you teach anybody? I mean, what's the common language? Right. There is no common language. Right. So children can't learn. So since they can't learn, they don't learn. And that becomes the basis of their education. Charter schools, the kids generally have the ability to go to uh, colleges. More of them qualify for college, although I'm not, I think that that's a wrong thing. Not everybody should go to college. Uh, I could tell you at Home Depot, we need electricians, plumbers, we need carpenters, welders. You could, if you're a welder, go to a welding school for crying out loud, you can make $125,000 a year to start as a welder. Why are you gonna to go to school and learn ethics or learn <laughs> you know, diversity? Right. You know, of course, <laughs> diversity 101. What the hell does that do for you? <laughs> and, then you and then you have to pay off debt on top of that. Right. So not everybody should go to university. Um, I, I went to college. I could tell you, I mean, honestly, uh, I could tell you that college did very little for me in helping me in my career. Virtually nothing in my career. Working did it in my career. Home Depot is a great story. At one point, we once did a, a, a survey of people working for us. And by the way, if you walk into a Home Depot store and somebody has a badge 20 years or 25 years, they're wealthy. They're probably a millionaire. Because of the stocks and- uh, Stock over the years that mm. they have an ability to buy stock in the company. And we did a survey and we found out that about between 75 to 85% of the people had high school education. Really? And think about the success of Home Depot. It's one of the great companies in America today. Absolutely. And a small percentage are still college graduates. You don't have to be a college graduate no. to be smart. You have to be a college graduate to have sales ability. You don't have to be a college graduate not to, to just have the common sense on how to deal with human beings and communicate with other people. And so uh, Home Depot was built on people that are not college graduates. So what the hell do we need college graduates for? Well, you need them in accounting, you certainly need them in legal, in those specialties that are necessary. But my God, taking care of people on the floor of a store, uh, you don't need that talent. You need the talent, the ability to speak sure. plainly, speak cohesively, and be able to explain how to use tools. And that's a success. We now have over 400,000 people working for Home Depot. And, and I could say that from the day we opened in 1979 to now, several million people have worked at the Home Depot. Baruch Hashem. I, uh, Baruch Hashem is right. <laughs> I, I go around the country, I meet people constantly to come up to me and, and just hug me and I say, hey, you know, hands <laughs> off, don't touch me. Uh, and say, you know, I worked for you for 15 years. Great, I learned so much. I opened my own business. I mean, I hear this constantly. And so uh, think about that. Think about that. This is the American story. This is really the American story. What would you recommend to young people? And I remember, I remember you, um, when, we, when we met a few weeks ago, you said if you're stuck in a job that you find monotonous and like that you can, you can really, you're motivated, you're innovative, and you want to bridge out and, and start your own thing, but sometimes you're kind of, you're stuck because you need to pay the bills and you, you know, you're, you're what, what would you, what would be the route that you would recommend someone to go from their monotonous job that's nine to five and that they're kind of bored with and that, and, but they really feel and have the passion to, to achieve. How do you, how do you start something new while dedicating, you, having to go to work and, 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 and live the life that you, and pay the bills that you have? Now that, that's going to take, <clears throat> that will take a book, which I may have to write one year. Okay. From, okay. And that book will be how to succeed in the world. And that book has to do with the one issue, and that is communication. One issue is communication and knowing yourself. Knowing yourself is very important. You, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your talents. You have to believe in your smarts. You have to believe that you're capable and you're, and if you don't believe in yourself, 
it's going to be very difficult for you to be successful at anything you do. So let's start with that. If you don't have self-confidence, and there could be a lot of reasons why you don't have self-confidence. Um, uh, a lot of kids grow up uh, being abused uh, rather than using it. By the way, I was a stutterer. I forgot to tell you that. Mm. I stuttered when I was a young oh, kid. Oh, wow, okay. I overcame the stuttering because I, it, it bothered me. It bothered me. Wow. And, I, and I worked at it. Wow. And I was careful in how I enunciated, how I pronunciated and speak too quickly. Uh, so I get the words out. And then after a while it became, so what I'm saying is you have to overcome your difficulties and you have to work at you at, at what, it, what you don't like about yourself. When you like yourself, you can be successful at anything you do. If you don't like yourself, right. you're not going to be successful anywhere, right. period, mm. okay? So that's my first word of advice is get to know yourself. Look at yourself as a human being. Try to uh, improve in those areas where you really need improving and to say, well, I'm perfect. You know, Nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect now. There are a lot of areas I have today which I'd like to see better, and I constantly work at it. Even at my age, I constantly want to be better than who I was. And this, the next thing that I think is very important is to be and do what you like doing. Anybody who is caught in a job or a career that you hate, the longer you stay in it, the more you become attached to it and the more difficult it is to get away from it. Mm -hmm. Do not allow yourself to fall into that rut where you just you get up every morning and say, ah, uh, right. I like that. Like, <laughs> what am I going on? I don't, yeah. I don't want to get out of bed. Right. Uh, or, or a job, I'll tell you the, the, the greatest thing I learned years ago. I was, I was at a store one day and I was, it happened to be like seven o'clock and I was giving a class in the store and I said to somebody, uh, what time is it? And he said, oh, I don't know. I think it's like one o'clock or something like that. I said, no, no, it's seven o'clock. He says, seven o'clock, where'd the time go? When you like what you're doing, right. time goes quickly. When you hate what you're doing, Time goes very slow. <laughs> and by the way, the more you hate your job, the more it becomes, it's like being caught up in molasses where you can't move. Everything mm -hmm. slows down. And after a while, just to get from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock becomes an eternity. And that means, dummy, <laughs> go do something else. Right. Do make less money. It's, it's not worth the money you're making. I would take less money right. and be happy with what I'm doing. Absolutely. Because then you're better with your family. You're better with your friends. You're better with everybody. When you're miserable, okay. you're grouchy, you're lousy, you're bad with your family, you're bad with your kids. Um, so I just don't do what you don't like to do and try to find the place and you can find a place. I remember I started out wanting to be a doctor. I ended up a pharmacist. Right. And now I sell hammers. Now, how do you figure that <laughs> uh, Well, think about no, it. it. How do you get from this to this to this? Well, it all happened because I wanted to be in a place that I enjoy. I love what I'm doing now. I love what I did at Home Depot. And I love this, the career of selling. I love selling, I love meeting people, talking to people, and you have to find that niche for yourself and life will be better for you. Mr. Marcus, thank you very much for sharing this, your wisdom from 90 years of experience, not only 90 years of experience, but 90 years of accomplishing and really transforming the world. So thank you so much for taking your time and being with us today and we'll see you all soon. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.